Hi, I'm going to read a little bit from the book. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. It's so awesome to be here. And by here, I mean on the planet and also <laughs> in New York. It's so awesome. I feel like I'm dreaming. And I'm also in the rare book room, which is so fancy. Isn't there just like a Bible that's like written by God that's in that case over there? It's like a million dollar Bible. Okay. Um, I'm just going to jump in. I'm just going to read a little bit. So I don't think you need to know anything. Um, for, for me, part of stumbling toward adulthood has included getting real about what things cost and not getting mad at the world about it. It's also understanding what I can and can't afford. This understanding is often psychedelically clouded by what I lovingly refer to as my scarcity issues. It's pretty simple. You grow up with money being scarce and it gives you hella issues. Mine manifests most powerfully in a terror that everything I have will somehow be taken away from me, probably through my own fuck ups and carelessness, and I will not only be broke again, but broker than ever. All the worst case scenarios I've managed to avoid, like outright homelessness, will make themselves clear as my destiny. In order to stave off this horror, my scarcity issues counsel me, I must make sure my cost of living remains low forever. Sure, I might be able to clamber over my issues to make a one-time purchase of a luxury leather hoodie, but I must never ever make a decision that raises my monthly bills, say getting better internet, hence my getting online via a telephone cable, snaking across my apartment for way too long, or acquiring a cell phone. I cracked years after everyone else in my life, and only at the bullying of a friend who was then required to come and hold my sweaty hand for the duration of the transaction. I can't get cable, because what if that extra monthly expense is the final straw that catapults me into extreme poverty? Same goes for health insurance. I'll just keep using the free clinics, thank you very much. For years I did my grocery shopping at Food for less, where the other broke folks wheeled their carts around, collecting our gently dented and discounted cans of soup. My scarcity issues were present whenever I spent more than $30 on anything. Later, after much personal work, the number was bumped up to 50, making me dizzy and flooding me with anxiety, but I slowly learned to tangle with them, to make the purchase in spite of feeling like it might literally give me a heart attack. In my youth, it was easy enough to cultivate a low level of taste. A pint of generic vodka, or better yet, an economical 40 ounce of malt liquor, malt liqueur, <laughs> and, a free, thank you, and a free poetry reading was all I needed to be happy. But in getting sober, your tastes change. Literally, you can like taste things. After decimating your appetite with stimulants, you are suddenly in love with food. You crave sweets or complicated savories. Plus, what do people do if they don't drink? They eat and go to the gym and become sex addicts. <laughs> and so it was that I became accustomed to shopping in the fancier grocery stores. You'd never expect that a young woman cruising the bulk bins at a health food store could be having such a profound nervous breakdown, but initially I was. I felt like I was betraying my mother, insulting her struggle by buying pricey food like it was no big thing, like I was somehow checking out of my class politics, aligning myself with the bougie mofos who'd spend $12 on a bulbous heirloom tomato. Like an outsider, someone infinitely more at ease inside a grocery store stocked with Oreos and Doritos than one peddling flaxseed crackers and purple carrots. You guys, carrots can be purple. <laughs> After a couple of years, I stopped feeling like a dirtbag imposter, someone more suited to a block of government cheese than a round of fromage aged in a French cave and packed in volcanic ash. I stopped writing the price code for the conventional rice on my bag of organic rice. It's like the saddest thievery ever. <laughs> so sad. The punk in me could argue that organic food should be free, and I deserved a discount on my health food after all I'd been through. But the more sober and clear I got, the more these defenses sound like the self-serving, juvenile attitudes they were. In my 12-step program, there was a lot of emphasis on living free of fear, changing fear-based behavior. Why would I engage in the pettiest of petty theft, passing off my $3 bag of organic rice as its $1.99 cousin? Because I was scared. I was scared that if I became accustomed to a lifestyle of organic rice, then I would be ruined. Ruined? Sure. Or if not ruined, punished somehow by someone. A terrible finger would point at me, dirt wedged under the nail, and hiss, traitor, class traitor, think you're too good for minute rice? Huh? You'll see. You'll end up back here with the likes of us eating 25 cent packages of ramen you can't even cook properly. Robin is a soup, but you cook it like a bunch of noodles sprinkled with the crumbly MSG laden flavor packet. Why? Because you have no taste. You get over it like you get over it, a bit at a time. By the time I was, I was visiting with my mother and sister in LA, I did not cry out in pain at the $200 Repetto's in the shoe boutique we tucked into. Well versed in the math of fashion, I understood that was simply what Repetto's cost. Of course they were worth every penny. They were French. Strange new politics entered my consciousness. So much of the expensive clothing 
clothing I coveted was made in Europe by people paid a living wage, engaged in a crafts tradition that had been passed down through generations, sustaining whole villages. Slowly the elevated price tags began to seem like a bit of justice. What was the real price of a pair of $30 shoes? Could it perhaps be more in line with my class politics to purchase a few higher quality, well-made items than to comfort myself with a piece of fast fashion made by Bangladeshi women who would be assaulted with high pressure hoses for protesting their working conditions? I persisted in lusting after luxury items, like the Labo Rose 31 perfume, which I'd had the good fortune of smelling when I was put up in a hotel that offered the scent in its toiletries. La Labo Rose 31 smells like you stumbled into some sort of divine cathedral consecrated to the worship of women. Mm. 1920s burlesque dancers, sultry Italian mothers of eight, the drag queens found in Jean Genet novels. Hookers. Expensive, successful hookers. It is a dark rose scent made darker with something spicy and churchy. At the hotel, I shampooed and conditioned my hair in it, and I scrubbed all my dirty bits with the smooth white cake of soap. I slathered myself in the lotion. Then I took everything and stuffed it into my bag so that housekeeping would leave me a new set. Then I stuffed that new set into my bag, and I did it all again a third time. As a former drug addict, I'm hesitant to claim to be addicted to something like a smell, but the truth is both drugs and smells set off complicated chemical reactions in your brain. And since I'd surely firebombed my brain's dopamine factory for years, impacting its output, and since smell can fire up your pleasure centers and ramp up dopamine, well, who knows exactly what happened in my brain as I huffed and puffed and blew my mind with the smell of this new perfume. Maybe my crisscrossed beat up brain waves were surging at the smell of La Labo Rose 31, eking out a little bit of precious dopamine. All I know for sure is when I ran out of my pilfered hotel toiletries, I missed that rich scent, and daydreams of walking into Barney's and having the nice perfume guy whip up a bottle with my name on it took over. Thanks, I'll stop there. Hey, beautiful. Hey, Saeed. How's it going? Good, how are you? <laughs> good, good. Um, I loved this book. I love this book, and, I, and uh, um, I know I love a book when I can't stop talking about it, and that's what I've been doing Thank you. Um, for the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm really glad you read the section you were talking about, um, because uh, there's a moment in the book where you mentioned going to Whole Foods with your sister and your mother, mm -hmm. and um, and your mother, uh, I, I, she picks up some item, and she's just aghast at how expensive it she is. She can't believe how much the meat cost in the right. meat counter, yeah. Right. And it's, you know, uh, it, it struck me as, both very familiar, uh, you know, when you talk about class mobility, um, but it also I was like, yeah, that's one of those moments where we grow up, where we're forced to see our parents as a, adults briefly in a way that's a bit jarring and painful. Yeah. Because you, you, you tell her, well, you think, you know, I want to tell her that there are poor people in Santa Monica too and that there are other places to shop, but you can never say that to your mom. No, because like everybody else in America, she thinks she's middle class. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, um, and, I, and I love you examined that throughout the book. So I want to start, I want to talk about money. Okay, let's talk about I money. Talk about money. <laughs> um, because it, it, it's such an important part of the book. And of course, it's a part of growing up, right, in adulthood. Um, how did it become such an, a prominent thing? Theme. I mean, I'm kind of obsessed with it, you know? I mean, I mean, we all are, mm -hmm. uh, right, on some level. Like, every, totally. so many of our, like, survival issues and the things that stress us out every day really get distilled to, down to money, you know? And, um, and the whole thing of, like, money can't buy happiness. I'm like, yes, it can. <laughs> it completely, I'm so much happier when I have more money because I feel, you know, more secure and there's more things that I have more freedom and... I mean, just growing up in a place that was so broke and living so brokely for so long. Like, I don't even think I realized while I was, well, when I was younger, how broke I was. Um, I, I didn't pay taxes or anything. I remember um, one year, I tried to do my taxes and I owed $60. And I was like, $60? I don't have that. <laughs> so I was like, that's it. I'm not, you know, paying taxes anymore. <laughs> and, um, and then that kind of caught up with me and I was like, okay, I have to, I have to kind of look at this. And, and I had been kind of socking away all my, like, all my taxi things and I grabbed it and I was like, oh my God, I made like $10,000 that year. I can't, how did I even live in right. San Francisco, you know? So I don't know. It's just, it's such a defining I mean, it, it defines the parameters of my world, and it always has. It defines the parameters of all of our worlds. Right. And yet it's really weirdly taboo. It's like more taboo than sex, really. You know, um, talking about what people make or what people don't make, and, you know, people feel 
defensive about it or scared about it and people feel attacking about it and angry about it i mean it's just it's everything yeah and i mean i think and, and there have been some discussions about this lately with writers in the publishing industry right and and the the rhetorical silence about wealth especially in a city like new york where mm -hmm. it's both an artist capital as is san francisco i um, and also incredibly in expensive to live in as a san francisco yeah, yeah. right so is, is that something you've been thinking about as you've been talking about the book now oh yeah totally i mean <sighs> You mean about like place Absolutely. in that way? Yeah, I mean, especially, you know, living in San Francisco, and I think everyone is dealing with the same kind of situation here in New York. It's like writers can't come, working class, poor, whatever, writers can't come to San Francisco to live at this point the way that I did. I mean, there's just no, there's the rents are so crazy expensive. Everyone that I'm close with in San Francisco have all moved to LA. Mm. And because I married somebody who actually works in the tech industry and had some money, and now we own a house. And it's like the weirdest thing. So it's like, I'm like, oh my God, my whole community has left and I'm super staked out here now because of this weird turn of fortunate events. But um, yeah, so that's a really trippy thing to own a house when your friends can't that's afford why. their and rent and they leave. Yeah, like yeah, yeah oh you know. Yeah, when I, I lived in San Francisco for a year, and the house that it, next to where I was renting went on sale, and I thought like a, a fucking helicopter was going to descend. You know, it was just like <laughs> all of these people. It was like such aggressive. You know, all of these cars. It was like just such an intense market. It was like, oh, this I gotta get out of here. This oh is oh my god, too rich for my blood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I remember we, we would. Um, my wife really like. She's one of those weird people that like to go look at houses. Mm -hmm. My mother's like that too. It always like made me feel really defensive. Like, <laughs> like you're just like fetishizing like wealth in this way, mm -hmm. which I'm much more. I'm much more um soft to now <laughs> you know i'm like that's fine but um but so she likes to do that so we would go look at houses i, I remember there was always like a pregnant woman or two or three looking and i was just like you know no, no one's gonna like the pregnant woman's always gonna get the house right like you should just like wear a fake belly like it's so competitive and like and so when we got our house i was pregnant you know so i was like yes i'm, I'm gonna get the house i'm pregnant you know and then you have to write a letter to the person selling it being like i'm a writer I'm the house is near the ocean i was writing my mermaid book and i'm gonna i'm pregnant i'm gonna write a book about a mermaid <laughs> you know and then you close you close a picture of you guys looking super wholesome and white and you're like oh that's and amazing. then we got the house yeah there's a moment in the book where uh <laughs> that's what you have to do so i guess good. note to Southside, get pregnant <laughs> to get an apartment. Um, i'm gonna work on it i'm gonna work on it um there's a moment in the book where you need to find an apartment because yeah. you, you've, you've been living in an apartment with 20-somethings who are both nice and lovable, but also 20-somethings. Yeah. Uh, and you're very like, I'm too grown for this, finally. Yeah. Right? Um, and so when you're on the hunt for the apartment, again, hunt, apartment hunting in San Francisco, yeah. no easy task. Uh, but you very fortunately, like an, an apartment appears. Huge score. Yeah. <laughs> total word of mouth, crazy apartment. Yeah. But people had to convince you to, to go, go for it. Because I was so scared. Because it was like, well, I was paying $800 to live with three people in their 20s. 20s and a refrigerator that I'm like 95% certain had maggots in it. So, and I was 39 years old and I was like, if I don't change this by the time I'm 40, I'm going to have really low self-esteem. So, so $800 and then I find this beautiful little one bedroom apartment, not even a studio for $1,100 and I was like, $1,100, who can afford that? I can't afford that. And my friends were like, are you serious? And I just was like super defensive and I was like, I, you know, it's just like, it just was my crazy brain, you know, and it took me letting it kind of sink in a little bit and like um, doing some tarot readings and then I was like oh god like I'm, my mind is really warped around money and right. stuff like this is yeah. actually a great you know thank god I, I jumped on it it really changed my life thanks it sounds like a great apartment it was beautiful um, and then there's the <laughs> Somebody help this gentleman. <laughs> we see you're trying. We see you're trying. Um, <laughs> been there. <laughs> totally. Been there. Might be there myself. Um, uh, but so when you get to the apartment, and I just this is such a subtle moment, but I think it points to um, the the flashes of humor and um, and heart in the book. So you're walking in to look at the apartment, and another couple is there too, and you're all sizing each other up, very yeah. you know politely, but and then you all realize oh no there are many apartments available in this building and then you're all nice yeah then we're all <laughs> nice to each other we stop judging each other you know so good. yeah so good. Like, i was just like oh god they're straight and they don't have tattoos and they probably make some they're probably in the tech industry they're totally gonna get it like i look like a drug addict oh you know and like yeah i love it so much i love it <laughs> so who knows much. what they were thinking you know like <laughs> I mean, because it, to me, what uh, part of what I loved about How to Grow Up is it's a joyful book. 
it's a joyful book um, and, and it's a hard earned joy you know mm -hmm. um, and it really feels like it's a book that is the process of moving from survival to really thinking about thriving yeah um, and totally. so and, and so with you know that obviously seems true for your life was that true yeah. while you were also working on the book in terms of how it came together yeah definitely I mean it came together I was like brainstorming with my agent who's amazing um, just of like what what would my next book be like what you know I love writing memoir I love writing about my own experiences um, and she was just like you know you she had this like outsider's view of me that I didn't necessarily I wasn't necessarily thinking about of just like oh you know you're like she knew enough of my story from my previous writings like oh you used to be like so so crazy you know and now like you're like a grown-up like how did that happen and I was like oh okay <laughs> I'm a reasonable facsimile of an actual grown-up um, <laughs> and so I was like oh maybe there is a story there then when I started looking at it I was like yeah of course there's a story there my god but when you're just engaged in it on such a deep level mm -hmm. it's hard to take that step back and see see like all the parts of your life that actually tell that story right was it difficult I mean because it is a unique challenge um, you you're you're excellent at writing about your your own life and um, you're so I mean that's Thanks. one of your superpowers um, but <laughs> just it, one it, <laughs> one of the many <laughs> one of the many the other one's fashion we're gonna get to that in a moment girl. <laughs> um, but you know also writing about your experiences and having to find the lessons right because it's yeah. in some ways it's a it's a, a take on the how-to form yeah was that a challenge yeah I mean it was a challenge in that it felt really while I was working on it felt so cheesy I was so terrified I was like am I just writing a giant cosmopolitan article right now you know um, like I, I have um, my friend Ali Liebegott is a really great writer and she wrote um, this article for self magazine a while back about how like she quit being an adjunct professor to work at a grocery store because it was actually better for her as a writer wow. to have that job mm. and so and we just as a result of her writing that we had this joke of like isn't it funny how life turns out how that's like the the punchline that like 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 a commercial article or a commercial book kind of wants like right. that isn't it funny how life turns out so I kept <laughs> looking for like the, isn't it funny how life turns out sort of punches and there actually are many you know and so I, I tried not to resent the structure and just like allowed it to um, be sort of a, um, a path to play with and to let the story tell itself okay. but yeah I was I was totally worried that like it sounded so cheesy mm -hmm. you know how did you get through those moments because that's that's a hard uh, idea to kind of grapple with when yeah you write a book. well I I was I was in too deep to turn back I was like doing the book you know mm -hmm. and so I just was like I just I just was like okay you know I've had a fairly fortunate run so far the books that I've written have not been terribly cheesy so this will be my cheesy book and I'll have the experience of what it's like <laughs> to write a cheesy book and wow. have people say things like she's gotten really cheesy you know <laughs> and stuff like that and I just was kind of like trying to just be like I was like oh well, I'll just see what that experience is like hmm. you know because also every time I write a book I think there's some massive problem with it and I'm freaking out hmm. you know so like the cheese was the problem my fear with this mm -hmm. book but then like when I wrote my book Rose of No Man's Land it was my first novel and I was just like this book just sucks it's stupid and it sucks and I was like well I'm just gonna have to see what it's like to write a really sucky book that everyone hates you know and yeah I like it too <laughs> That's a pretty actually. good strategy. I'm really into that. Yeah, I was just like, yeah. I'm just going to see what that experience is like. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, what's so weird is as a writer, you can kind of salvage almost any bad experience. I'm like, because then I can go on and write a book about a writer who wrote a really shitty book <laughs> and write about that experience, about my shitty book, right. you know, like. How to survive And then I can book. have a comeback. Yeah. Which is cool. Into it. You know, into I it. mean, I'd rather not have to have a comeback. This is like so a three book plan you have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, shitty book. Figured it out. Okay, book the shitty book, the comeback right. book. Okay. The reality television yeah. show. Yeah. yeah, so good. <laughs> oh my god, did you see the movie about um the 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 documentary about Isaac Mizrahi? No, what? It's so Tell me everything. good. It's basically about his comeback. It's like it it's shot like after like he was Isaac Mizrahi and then he like he did a line that everyone hated and then they started doing the movie right in his next collection which he had to have a comeback uh, and it's so good it's all it. that whole like so let's talk about fashion first of all of background let's talk about clothes so um, one of my favorite essays in the book is fashion victim which we're actually <laughs> going to talk about um, and and Michelle goes to Paris Fashion Week and it's amazing it's and I want the best thing that ever to happened to me this. in my whole entire it's life so magical nothing that good will ever happen to so me ever good, again so good so when we were back there before this started um, I told her that last night um, I decided to treat myself because I also 
love fashion. I love studying fashion. Always have in the same way. So I was really excited to see you talk about it in the book. And I was like, I'm gonna buy something fabulous for Michelle so I can like look at. So I bought this this Kinzo sweatshirt, which I'm like, I was take like, a look, treat like, myself, like, treat myself. Here we go. Look, look like at a little it. Tiger. And it's like this really lovely. Oh, it's like really thick, so like embroidery, like it's made out of like a yeah, like it's made of magic. magic. Yeah. Okay, what can go wrong? Nothing. Um, and so then I'm telling you about it, and you say, I'm like. My three-month-old son has that. <laughs> like, I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. My friend, if you, if anyone's read the book, in the Fashion Week chapter, I talk about my friend Annie, who I love so much. And she went, she goes to Paris a lot, because she's very glamorous, and she went to Printemps in Paris, and she bought a, the onesie of that. There was a onesie of that. What a time to with, be like, alive. With <laughs> Isn't this great? Isn't I mean, it's great? gray, yeah. but it's like the tiger uh, with the Kenzo, and it's so like a little fucking onesie. I'm so and I'm just like, I miss my baby so much. It's like you're my little baby. <laughs> so good. Oh my gosh, I love it. So, let, let, so let's okay. talk about fashion victim. Okay. Um, t- can you c- give us a, a, a sample of of what happened so people can understand? Okay, it, it's basically kind of talking about um, my relationship with fashion growing up from a very young age, where I really liked playing dress up, basically, but like serious like to take taking dress up to the streets and what happens to you um, you know the kind of ho- immediate kind of um, sort of like censure and punishments that kind of come with that from being a kid to you know I grew up on the East Coast I grew up um, right outside Boston and it's very punishing especially in the 80s like if you look different it was like you were betraying the tribe so the tribe had to turn against you and try to kill you you know mm-hmm. and and so there was like a lot of um, just a, a lot of like I guess like bullying um, imagine like boys call Calling you faggot. Yeah, boys and calling me like, faggot. I'm, I'm like, what? even. Yeah, I know. I'm just like, Wild. okay. Wild. Yeah. And in a, in a way, I felt like it was. And you you talked about this where it's it's queerness, right? Because that, yeah, like a, like a, a joyful embrace of fashion is you're queering. Yeah, you're queering. And it's totally. A, it's a, an, an approach to art, and so that that is something that people respond to so aggressively. Is. Yeah, I mean, I was when I was in high school, I wasn't. You know, I didn't identify as queer. I I like I like dated like goth boys that looked like girls, which was very queer but I wasn't really thinking of it like that (laughs) still into it Um, and so the people were but I, but I understood like I was constantly getting called like a faggot or a queer like it just was so wild and and it gave me a really great political kind of consciousness you know like in this way where I was like oh these fucking assholes are bothering me because I look the way I do and they, I know that you know they're the same Irish white people from Massachusetts that fuck with everybody who aren't you know other Irish white people from Massachusetts so um, yeah so it gave me like I don't know a sense of um, of yeah like of that the clothes that you wear can turn people against you but they also kind of signal they flag to other people that like you're part of their tribe too I don't know yep. so it talks a lot about that stuff and Absolutely. then about how I, I get this opportunity to go to fa- to Paris Fashion Week but it happens while I'm also teaching at a very nice college it's paying me very nicely to, to teach writing to young women and um, I have to decide kind of like what am I going to do because they wouldn't let me go so I decide to sneak to Paris Fashion Week yes girl and then I get caught yes. and essentially fi- I have to make this decision like am I gonna basically throw this job away um, to go to par- Paris for two weeks which I, of course I worth do it. yeah completely worth, worth it. it completely worth it oh my God. I like say now wishing <laughs> wishing I had that job so bad but it's, fine. <laughs> it's fine it's fine it's fine it's fine none of the clothes from Paris fit me anymore but it's fine it's oh. fine oh. yeah I can't even and like amazing things happen you're like seeing celebrities yeah there are places crawling with celebrities I, I was like okay I just wanna what did I say I was like I wanna get my picture taken I want to see Kanye West and I want a purse like uh-huh. three ridiculous things right. like they all happened yeah. like all happened yeah. I got I, I ended up like in the main picture ended up in the New York Times right. um, yeah the editor of, of Purple Magazine yeah yeah that dude took a picture of my tattoo <laughs> yeah and then like I was at the Jeremy Scott show and there were these um, Jeremy Scott for Longchamp bags that are just these amazing bags with big telephones all mm. over them and they were only for people who had front seats which we did not have front seats you know me and my friend Annie didn't have front seats but then this thing happened when they were pulling up the it, like if you've ever been to a fashion show, like the the, the runway is oh, like right. taped down with tarp, and right before it starts, they they pull the tarp up. It's very dramatic, and you're like, oh, oh the fashion show's starting. The models are gonna come up, and so and they're very intense. They're like, take your seats, take your seats, and so the only the only seat was right there, and it was a front row Fate. seat with the free bag on it. Yes, girl. So I just sat on it. I sat on the bag. <laughs> I was just like, fuck, and I was turning to my friend Annie, and she's sitting on her bag, and we're both like, fuck, yes. and, and I, I drew, and I was like taking notes the whole time because I was writing about it for the Believer, and I drew a little 
stick figure picture of me crying and punching somebody <laughs> trying to take my I was like this is what I will do if someone tries to take <laughs> my bag away and then this bitch tried to take my bag away afterwards and she's just like she just knew that I somehow didn't wasn't didn't deserve the bag like I was not a front row person and she started she kind of put her hand on it and I was like no yeah I was like that is my bag it's and so then we great. went backstage and who's there Kanye West I love it just there just and, hanging and Amber out Rose too, who was yeah the Amber Rose was just yeah. amazing like there were just photographers all around her she just was like like just doing like like the tiniest bit of movements like like and they're just like you know like just mixing it up just wow. like a centimeter just like oh. she was amazing and um <laughs> so and good. then we got to go i um my, oh, i was a, yeah we got oh. to because i was there the reason i was so there awesome. is my friend i know it's so endless too um my friend <laughs> thank you my friends in a band and they got to do a big show that Fen they got to play the Fendi party at the end. That's how come this whole thing happened. I got they invited me to come stay with them. And so she got brought to the Fendi showroom, which is just this room full of like fucking Fendi clothes. And they were just like, take what you want. So she's just like taking everything. And then like me and Annie, they gave us like sushi and like a little gold comb. <laughs> and meanwhile, our friend who's like super famous is like taking like fur capes and like all this stuff. And then he left to let her, sh you know, shop in peace. And she's like, y'all grab something and I was like oh my god and I just like <laughs> grab this Fendi purse it's like I don't even know how much money it probably cost. it had to be like five thousand dollar purse it's fucking crazy yeah. crazy purse and and just threw it on the pile of her stuff and then I got this Fendi purse I love it. and then I went back to my hotel and cried yeah and, and that's and I want to read about that part it's so beautiful oh okay it's very beautiful so so all of this has happened because this is what you have to understand about this essay it's not just that Michelle like went to Paris Fashion League and was like walking around she's like living the life like living it totally um, and so it's like I was like like that Shirley Temple movie <laughs> you know it was like I was Shirley Temple yeah it was, yeah. A, it was like the like movie montage yeah it was like Pretty Woman yeah, yeah absolutely but I didn't have to have sex with Richard Gere <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, hey, never it takes. Um, so, so she's in the hotel room and she's starting to get really overwhelmed, right? Because it's almost like too much joy, like Andre Lee and Tyler. That, that's just too much fashion. Um, and, and so you uh, reach out, you email your sister. Mm-hmm. And you just say, I'm like, I'm overwhelmed. I kind of don't know what's going on. And her sister gives the best advice. And I think it's one of the most beautiful moments in the book. My sister's reply was swift. Sometimes she wrote, I sit back in that house that I live in in Santa Monica where I can see the ocean, where I live with my incredible husband and our beautiful baby daughter, where I'm not struggling, where I get to be a stay-at-home mom like I dreamed. And I go back and I say to the 13-year-old me who felt so out of place and trapped and hopeless, don't worry. You're going to grow up and get out of here and have the life you want. Michelle, she continued, you used to get beat up for the way you looked. You and Ma fought every day for four years about how you dressed. You need to go back to your teen teenage you and tell her, don't worry. You're going to grow up and get out of here and have the life you want. You're going to get to go to Paris and go to the shows. And you're going to get an incredible $5,000 purse for free. <laughs> Because that is just what is going to happen to you. You're not going crazy. It's a big deal. I just love that. Oh, God. I, so I'm so sleep deprived. I'm going to cry. <laughs> look out. Look out. That's how we get you. That's how, new, that's how we wear you down in God, New I York. like you reading my book so much better than me reading it. You're so, such a beautiful reader. It was just so great. I mean, it's just, you know, because I think joy... Um, is it's kind of difficult to write about. It is. Right? It is. It, it it's uncomfortable to write about too. Why? You know. Why is it like I don't know. I mean, I just feel like I've um, written a bunch about myself and about my life, which is kind of like ballsy, really, if you think about it. You know. And it's like, well, who am I to, you know, write about my life and and act like th it matters to anybody? Hmm. And um, for so long, I think like the the kind of the justification I gave. I mean, the reality is I write like that because that's just I'm just driven to do that. Hmm. You know what I mean? There's no real rhyme or reason to it. But I said a lot that like, well, there's no stories about girls like me out in the world and blah, blah, blah. And like people need to hear about, you know, queer girls and class and all this stuff. And it's, and that's true. Um, but it also, I don't know. So it, it kind of like gave me this place, this kind of bravado to be able to write boldly about myself. And then this book is like my life's kind of awesome and it feels really you know you don't have that same bravado like does everyone want to hear about how my life's awesome you know you just feel like a fucking asshole really it's like you know it just felt like kind of it was it, it, it made me feel really uncomfortable you know I guess I'm very comfortable writing about struggle um and feeling that kind of like righteousness in it mm -hmm. and 
so this book felt really uncomfortable for me to write because you know I felt like I was like I don't know does it feel like a different kind of intimacy yeah mm. for sure because well there's because that there really isn't that much bravado like you, there can be a lot of bravado when you're writing about struggle or at least that's how I wrote about it like kind of hard assed you know and and sassy and whatnot and like the, that's not necessarily you can't really use that sort of armor when you're when you're writing I could I felt like I couldn't access it for this book wow. because it just it wasn't appropriate you know hmm. so wow um so you know uh Something I, I've uh, been thinking about lately is, you know, in the process of having a book and, and be, having it out in the world, and you're talking about it constantly, you start learning from your book, because, <laughs> you know, as you keep talking. Have you learned anything from... I feel like I am right now. Like, you know, I don't know. I know what you mean. Yeah. It's like, you're like, I don't know, there's something about writing that is so subconscious, Yes. you know, that like, you just, in, a, in, in a way, you don't even know what you're doing until it's done, and you're in these scenarios where you're talking about right. it like this, and you're like, oh, God, I didn't even realize I was doing that, I'm or... I'm not the only one who felt that way. No, you're not okay. at all. I think it's like, really, I don't know, like, I feel like I'm in a fugue state when I'm writing. I, like, I go back, like, when this, when I got, you know, the the advanced reader copy, which is, this is, I was like, look, I like, didn't even remember writing half of it. I was like, who <laughs> wrote this, you know? And I feel like that about my other books, too. It's yeah. like you go, I go into some sort of black hole totally. and um, and so yeah it is like having to kind of reacquaint myself with it and yeah it's trippy it's, it's really very, it's, it's very, very strange it's weird to be a writer yeah, I still get lost in my poetry collection like I'm going there I'm like I know there's a there's where's this poem I know it's in there I wrote it can't find it though it's a very strange phenomenon congratulations on your poetry thanks. collection thanks yeah pretty cool Neat very stuff. cool yeah Neat stuff um, and I, I guess I wanted to ask you about that you've written and I know you've you talked about this a bit before in terms of deciding on the book but you've written in so many forms you've written poetry You've written, you know, young adult novel and, you know, and you um, are so brave about embracing different forms. Um, were there different iterations of this book uh, earlier in the process? No, this is really it. It just kind of came out like that. I love it. Yeah, yeah, I, thank God. <laughs> I hate rewriting. I'm really, yeah, I'm not very good at editing. Really? So, yeah. I mean, you know, I'll do it if I have to. <laughs> I like, for a while, I was like, first thought, best thought. I was, I was just like, you know, just like, whatever. I'm like a beatnik, man. It's like, no, you're fucking lazy. Edit your book, you know? So I try to be more, like, push myself to edit more than I used to do. But yeah, I really like, um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm able to sit down and, and produce a lot. I just kind of like spew and barf, you know? And then I just want to be done. I just want it to be perfect, you know? <laughs> Wouldn't that if be only. nice? Oh yeah, gosh. I know. If only. But but that this as far as the structure and the stories, I mean, I did do some edits on it, of course. Mm -hmm. But it pretty much retained like that's yeah. the shape that it came out in. Yeah. Were there uh, and because you're having to reflect on your life and then like move to lessons, uh, were there any surprises over the course of writing the book where you're kind of like, oh wait, that is that is what I learned, huh? Um. Hmm. I don't know. I think I I think I kind of n knew it mostly. You know. Um, I mean, yeah, I think, I think that in, in outlining the book, which is what I did before it, okay. I kind of did, I did a lot of like note taking and thinking about, like I connected those dots, I think before I sat down to write it. Okay. Yeah. Groovy, groovy. Yeah. Um, what else did I want to, add? there was a section, well, I don't really, need to, it, it, you were, you talk about, um, spending Thanksgiving with your friends and how one of the things, you know, you, you and your friends have in common is that you have all made it, you know, very far from where you started. Yeah. Um, and are still, it's it's something that you, we grapple with, right? Um, you know, when we when we come from working class backgrounds and are able to make it to a safer space, uh, we have to figure out how to live with that safety. Um, do, do you still feel that way? Yeah, I mean, I I think that it gets easier. I feel like when you become conscious that it's a thing for you mm. and start actually grappling with it consciously, that's what makes it start getting easier. I feel like I just kind of floundered in it for a while without really thinking about it and it just was like, well, this is just what life is, you know, mm. like feeling anxious all the time and and unsure and then at some point, I guess I just was like, oh, actually, I don't have to approach life that way, you know? And once I got that kind of clarity on what was going on, then it, it started to... Um, get smaller but it's still there I feel like it's always there you know like 
I don't know, like I, I went to fucking Topshop today. They're having a two dollar necklace sale. Stop. Necklace fans. Yeah. What? Two dollars. It's amazing. And, I, and I'm just like, two dollar necklaces, I can buy a million of those, you know? <laughs> so I bought like a million two dollar necklaces and totally had that thing checking out like God, put two of them back. Yeah. You know, I put two of them back, you know, the two dollar necklaces. Cause there's just something about like and it's not like I know like I'm okay, I could have spent that extra four dollars, everything's okay, you know, I just spent it on a fucking coffee around the corner. But um it's more like if I give in to that desire for so much, like what will, where will it end? Where will it bring me? You know, wow. it's like, yeah. That's it's why, I mean, because there's a moment where earlier in the book you uh, talk about um, buying uh, a leather hoodie. Yeah. you wanted for a long time. I was you, so obsessed with it. Yeah, and it's very, it's like it, you buy it like at a Barney's or yeah. like Bloomingdale's and it's a very, I think you have to call a friend immediately afterwards to kind of to, to have her talk, talk me down. It. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was so high from it. Wild. Yeah. Wild. Yeah, I was so high from it because I'd never spent that much money on something that wasn't like a computer. Hmm. Something that like you need. There's no way around it. Wow. Like I did not need that leather hoodie at all and there's a moment it was very subtle where you're in the who needs a leather hoodie? who needs a leather hoodie we all do we need in a way hoodies. we all metaphorically we all need our own metaphorical leather leather hoodie yeah, yeah. Totally. it's armor um <laughs> but you're you walk into the store and you're actually surprised that the that the clerk is so nice to you yeah and i was like oh that's really deep oh god yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, it's, no, it's, no it's true though i mean like it just feels like um i don't know i just I, again i think just like growing up um having so much when i was first started going out into the world as like a young person i was constantly getting negative feedback mm. i can't I mean, I can't really express enough what it was like to look like a freak in 80s Boston. It was like very violent, you know? And it was just so um, formative that I remember I ha when I first moved to San Francisco, I um, was walking down the street like in the throes of a, like a PTSD that I didn't even understand I had apparently because this woman g looks at me and I have like blue hair and she goes she's like nice hair and I was like fuck you I like oh scream <laughs> fuck you at her because for years wow. in Boston would people would say nice hair and they never meant nice hair they meant you look like a fucking retard wow. that's what they meant because it was it was Boston in the 80s. Yeah, so I was like, oh, and I saw this look of horror on this poor hippie lady, sweet hippie lady who liked my whimsical blue hair. You know, and I was like, oh my God, that's really dark. She probably like just that. thought you were from New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's things like that. Like me and my friends, like when I, when, when I was in high school, we called it punk rock paranoia. Like we'd be wait, like when you're waiting for the train and you hear people laughing and you're just like, they're laughing at me, you know, cause they were often uh -huh. laughing. They were often laughing at me, you know? And so it's like, you know, we did, had to know about PTSD, but I think that's pretty much what it was, yeah. you know? And so there's little germs of that that just stay with you. Right. You know, you have to kind of rewrite your story. Totally. Yeah. I mean, because one of the things we do when we're growing up, part of what it is, is I think uh, recognizing what we're still carrying with us, yeah. what we've brought with us. And even, you know, you can move across the country, you can get a new job, you can become a new person, but you're still bringing, you know, your life with you. And I think often it's, um, I think we forget that sometimes. We're all children masquerading as adults. You ain't lying. Somebody said that once and I thought they said we're all children masturbating as adults. <laughs> Also so th true. So that's what I like to say now. <laughs> We're all children masturbating as adults. Oh man. <laughs> I need that like tattooed. <laughs> Um, oh, also, this is this is and this isn't so much a question, but I just wanted to talk to you about you hitting on the guy who gave you your tattoo. Oh yeah, I hit on my tattoo artist. What a <laughs> dumb thing to do. Oh, it's so horrible. Oh. You're basically the equivalent of the dude that hits on the stripper. Wild. Because you're like, she likes me. She was just giving me these eyes. <laughs> you're like, you're paying her. I was like, he just kept staring at me <laughs> and just kind of looking at me and being like. Yeah. I was like, yeah, he's looking at his art that he just put on me. It's not and it's like, actually worse because you describe it and you reach out, you text him and he nicely kind of passes. He's and all then like, you're like, thanks, but no. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, and then I have to go back two or three more times to finish the tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, this is like, um, hand, like these things I'm getting those, like, you know, perilously close to my breast basically. <laughs> so it's like half the tattoo I have to do without my shirt on. So I just felt like such a creep. I felt like I was basically just like molesting him the whole time. <laughs> it was awful. It was well, so awful. Because well, you don't mention, but what was it like when you went back to finish it was it i mean it, it was fine i mean he was like a very aloof person okay. so i just tried to be aloof as well i was like well i don't care <laughs> like, oh, nothing going on here yeah, yeah totally <laughs> i mean what are you gonna do it's just like it's just it's 
you know, like like my friend told me, you have to get rejected. So the whole, the context of this is that I just had gotten out of an eight year monogamous relationship, and I had lost my mind and gone completely feral, and just was like, how do I have sex with somebody, you know? <laughs> and just was like, suddenly I could have sex with theoretically whoever I wanted to, you know? They would have to want to have sex with me back, as I learned sure, from sure. the tattoo artist. But yeah. but so I just was kind of like, oh my god, I want to have sex with the tattoo artist. He's so cute, and and my friend was like, just do it, just you know, just be prepared to get rejected, and so yeah, and so then I was. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like if I had written a really bad book, it's you know what I mean? You just live through it, and now exactly, and then I can write about it. <laughs> and it's there you go. I just love it so much. <laughs> um, there, you know, the book it, um, because you're it, you open it up to looking at all the different aspects of your life: love, relationships, um, recovery from addiction, uh, class, fashion. Um, were there were there are some aspects? Obviously, you're a very fearless writer. Um, but are there some parts of your life that are um, uh, harder to write about? Um, you know, writing about other people mm. gets progressively harder than it did when I was younger, mm. you know? I just think that um, when I was younger, the um, the consequences of that felt a lot easier to blow off, and maybe that's because I, at the time, was writing about people who weren't gonna be in my life anymore, and now I think that the people in my life are gonna stay in my life, you know? And so it's, um, and I just think, I just don't have that bravado where I just was like, should have acted right then, you know? Like, <laughs> it's like nice to feel like that, but then I also feel like, oh, but actually it's much more complicated than that, you know? And so, yeah, so, so that's hard. I mean, I wrote a lot about a relationship um, that I was in for a really long time, and it was a really hard relationship, and I love the person who, I, like my ex, like I totally love him, we're super close. Which relationship is it in the book? It's the eight year relationship with oh. the rapper, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And, then he, and he like got in touch with me, he was like, hey, hey, so uh, people are kind of contacting me. Am I in your book? And I was like, oh, yeah, but it's cool, man. It's like <laughs> super, you know, compassionate and stuff. It like, is. I mean, I hoped that it was. Yeah. Like, I really, uh, believe me, there was a time when I was writing very vengefully about this oh, person, girl. but uh, not anymore, you know? <laughs> so then, but then I felt so like, oh, God, you know, I think it's okay, but what if he's sensitive? And like, now I have to wait for him to like buy the book and read it. And I feel like there's like this, you know, anvil hanging over my head. And he probably feels the same way. So I, w I went with my phone and I took a picture of every page that I mentioned him and texted them to him. And he hasn't gotten back to me yet. Stop! <laughs> <laughs> no! He hasn't gotten back to me yet. I don't, I mean, he's not the type of person to sit on a feeling. So <laughs> I am, I think maybe just, maybe his phone's broken Maybe he lost his phone. Yeah. Maybe he lost I his mean, phone. I mean, I just think if he was mad, he'd let me know. And if he wasn't mad, he'd let me know. But I just mm. was like, I keep remembering, like, I'll just, <laughs> yeah, I'll just be, like, cruising along, and I'll be like, oh, I never heard from them, and then I'll just, like, feel total terror for, like, five seconds, and then I'm just like, it's fine, it's fine, it's, it's, it's cool. fine, it'll, it'll be, be fine, cool. yeah, it'll be fine, it'll be it'll fine, be cool. yeah, yeah. Oh, man, I reconnected with some ex-boyfriends when I, because I, I, with the book, I kind of called them to, like, you know, on page 21, you might recognize. You're such a good person. Well, I, I never do that. I was like, they're going to come kill me. They're going to come kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did, did they, did they care? No, uh, they didn't care. Yeah. One of them finally, like, months later, was like, oh, yeah, I guess I'll buy the book. Is that if that's Come what you want? Come on! Yeah, <laughs> hey, that's why you're fucking ex uh, Yeah, no, it's cool. Um, what else? What else is there? Hmm. I was like, I'm, uh, as I was, um, there's this one part when I, in the book where I'm just like, and he's a rapper, if you can yeah. believe it. And so when I <laughs> sent that part to him, I was like, sorry about the rapper low blow. He's actually a super talented musician. I was about to say, he's yeah. like a good He's a like, good yeah, he's great. Okay. He's really good. And I, I was also like, and he watched the real world. Oh. <laughs> and now I'm just like, I, to I totally love the challenge. You know that, sh that does yeah. anyone watch the challenge? I fucking love that show. It's like, it's like the people from the real world, like, like bungee oh. jumping off buildings. Things, basically it's just Isn't like they have they on? do it's totally still on wow the new season just started mm -hmm. and i'm totally into it and so i feel really like when i sent him that piece i was like listen if you need me to go public about watching the challenge after making fun of you about the real world i'll do it and because I, I love the challenge <laughs> and in fact this relief really, and i also watch the bachelor and i've or the bachelorette whatever's going on and this funny thing has happened i think that like i have weird like um latent psychic abilities that are completely beyond my control i have no control over them and they are about random ass bullshit that who cares <laughs> so i have psych i have sex dreams about whoever is going to win a competitive reality show that i'm watching 
So when I was watching The Bachelor, no, I'm serious. And Nikki, Nikki, when Nikki won the bat, the Bachelor or the Bachelorette or whatever it was, yeah, she won the Bachelor with one one Pobs. And um, I had this dream that it was like it was her, but she was also Cara Delevingne, and she was just like throwing me down. It was oh, a great, okay. it was a great dream. Sounds lovely. And I was just like, oh my, and then she won, and then. La and then the last time I watched the challenge, I jumped that I was in this like Polish diner and uh, Johnny Bananas was like hitting on me and we made out and boom, he won the challenge. What in the world? It was weird. It's weird. So I'm waiting to have a sex dream about somebody on The Bachelor and the challenge this time too. No, The Bachelor was still on. Damn. Yeah, it's always on. It's been, it's been going on. <laughs> it's like it just like it's always on. <laughs> I love it. Um, so something else. Are we are we good on time or? Oh, okay. You can't so, just stay here forever. At the periphery, you're like run. Um, you you know because you because you've written about your life before, um, and you're one of those people. There's a line in um, Sula by Toni Morrison where where the main character says, "I I sure did live in this world," um, and you're one of those people who absolutely gets to say that. Um, how did you balance? Um, alluding to like alluding to or explaining more complex aspects of your life so at one point you're like you know that was my last bush with crime except for you know sex work and then you just move on <laughs> you know so it's not yeah. a whole story how did you kind of negotiate you know what to tell and what to just kind of i mean i negotiated that by whatever I, tr making sure that i st i love to write tan tangentially like i love to go on a tangent and yeah sometimes it really works and it's fun yeah and sometimes you just you start out here and then you're like oh wait what was i even talking about so i, I wanted these each essay to really have a focus yeah. so sometimes i'd come upon some a bit of information that felt relevant but if i went too deep into it it would it would hijack the story yeah. you know what i mean so it was like worth mentioning that i'd done sex work because it was appropriate then but i you know that's the kind of thing that if you let it then that's like all somebody's going to want to hear about and I just felt like, book. yeah. Well, I, I also just felt like it was like the who, my the like readers like it's not that big of a deal. Like readers can just be like, oh, she did sex work, you know. Yeah. Like we don't have to right. talk about how I, I was or wasn't molested as a child. You know what I mean? Like it's like people can ha just kind of like trusting that the readership can handle absolutely these bits I of mean, information. And, and that, that was an aspect of the book I really loved. This sense of of your respect for the reader's humanity by you know like you you don't condescend by feeling the need to explain queerness. You're just like queerness, you know, and sometimes you're dating women, sometimes men, you know, it's not, yeah. you know, and that, that it is, it's all, you're like, well, let's talk about what we actually want to talk about. I yeah, totally. To like, you. like, like dating, like scrubs, yeah. whatever the gender may be, you know, <laughs> totally. Like, that's the point of that. Not like, they're all scrubs. They're just like dating people who are dumb to date. Not, it doesn't really matter what, you know, who, who they are. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks. Is there, so let's, let, so you're a new mom. I'm a new mom. You're a new mom. Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, thanks, you guys. High five. Yeah, it took me long enough. <laughs> <laughs> New mom, you moved from being a queen to a goddess. Um, so, you know, so what aspects of growing up are you are you still learning now? Or are you still trying to figure out? Oh my God, um, I don't even know. I haven't slept in so long. Um, really, um, you know, I feel like. I feel like the even the that I have this baby and that I'm taking care of this baby and he's you know three months old and I have kept him alive for three months like I am good. an adult you know what I mean like I that, fe that feels like I don't know if it's like I mean it's certainly a, another level of responsibility that I'm sure you can like freak out about if you think about it too much like I'm responsible for it but I, I haven't had a lot of feelings like that it feels just mostly like I've re I've trained for this I've wanted this like I'm ready for this now and and um, and it's actually so playful. Like I just spend my days with this little giggling <laughs> bean, like wagging fucking toys in its face, <laughs> and it it's a, you know, its face. <laughs> but it's like I don't know. Like it's really funny. Like I actually feel like very. Um, young a lot with with him like i i feel like an adult in that i actually feel totally capable of taking care of him which is amazing but i also just feel like i spend all my days playing i guess and that's just like really really interesting his favorite song is sonic youth's goo it's so oh, fun it's the best song for a baby because it's all goo 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 <laughs> you know and he really loves it he laughs and stuff uh, so yeah i love it i know i do too it's really it's just so fun it's so fun it's so good um and something else i wanted to um ask you about you know, um, are, are there sisters um, up to this book in terms of other books out in the world that you love very much uh, that you thought about when you were working on it? Or maybe you see connections now in retrospect? Oh, that's such a great question. God, and this is going to be one of those things that like 
like you know all the books you love and then you, right. somebody asks it's you true. and you're like um, I would have fainted uh, if you had just asked me yeah so, sorry no no that's okay, okay. um <laughs> I was reading um Sloan Crosley oh, okay. um yeah I was looking when I was just kind of trying to think about like what what is it like to write because I've written memoirs but I always write them like novels you know like novelistically like that's my agenda is to try to tell the story as novelistically as possible so this was so different in trying to just write a bunch of essays so you know I was I read her and um god I guess David Sedaris although like sometimes I like him and sometimes I don't um I don't know god yeah no I'm not sure that works I mean I saw that and I thought of um Cheryl Strayed. Uh, oh God, I love Cheryl Strayed. Totally yeah, totally yeah, I love her. Tiny, tiny, beautiful things. There's an aspect of that. Okay, that's cool. It's gorgeous. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, how are we on time? Do we have time for? Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna open it up to questions from you guys. Anybody? <laughs> Don't be shy. It's okay if you need a moment. <laughs> I run a reading in San Francisco that I always have cookies during the Q&A so that we don't have to sit in awkward silence. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it works. <laughs> Hi, oh, there's Michelle. So, hi, Dia. Nice no, there's to so see many, you. It's so great to see you. There's so many people here that I love. This is so exciting. Um, uh, oh, I'm having performance anxiety. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I guess I'm thinking of what you said about um, you know being somewhat uncomfortable with, with, with not having a... Um, you know, a scarcity-filled or anxious life now, having a more contented life and writing a memoir under those circumstances. Um, so I guess I was thinking, like, maybe something's come full circle. Like, you wrote a lot of, like, like um, you know, downtrodden or, you know, up from difficult times kind of stuff. Um, and then now maybe you've done this thing that's more like a generous gesture rather than a gesture of, like, struggle or emancipation. Maybe it's a gesture of, like, I got here and I'm going to help other folks maybe and I guess I'm thinking one what do you think of that like idea and then what would be next <laughs> whoa um that's I mean that's love that's so lovely that's I mean like I don't I would love for it to feel like generous to, and helpful to anyone I mean that's so crazy you know like I actually um I had a friend who, after reading it, broke up with her boyfriend, <laughs> which I felt so like of that's two good. minds about. I the was like, "The breakup chapter is very useful." Yeah, I mean, that's what she's thought, and so she broke up with her boyfriend. <laughs> and so, and, uh, and I was partly like, "That's fucking awesome, yeah, man! Girl. Like, that's so cool." But then it's like terrifying. You're like, "Why would you take my advice? Like, are you sure? You know, it's like that funny thing where you you give advice and somebody actually takes it because most people don't actually take advice, and you're like, "Oh my god, that's like scary or something." So. So that would be nice if it was helpful, I guess, you know. And next, um, I have, well, I, I'm still kind of in the middle of this trilogy of young adult fantasy books about mermaids. And so the next one, the second book is going to come out in June. And then I'm like halfway through writing the third one. And I'm, I'm half like, will I ever write again? I have a baby. I don't know. I, I'm sure I'll finish it. Um, and then I have a book that I b have been writing for a long time called Black Wave that actually, it's like the first book that I've ever written that I really like. Hmm. Like, no, I don't know. How, I mean, the, fir the first book you've ever written that you really like. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. No, but I mean, like, Unpack I don't know. That. It's like, it's so weird to write a book. Like, you're just so, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm sure this, there's tons of writers here who know what I'm talking about. You just, you have to sit with so much, like, self loathing and self doubt when you're yeah. writing it. So, you know, I mean, yeah. you I mean, you, I, I guess, I, yeah. yeah I, I come out through on the other end and sure. I end up liking it. Yes. I end up being totally okay with all of my books. I'm like, I'm totally cool with this. But this book, I was like giddy writing. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was having so much fun. I was like, so maybe it means it really sucks. I don't know. Like, I don't know. But anyway, but now you got to know what that feels I like. I got to know what it feels like to write a really sucky book. <laughs> so that this book, Black Wave, is coming out uh, next year, next January, on the City, City Light Sister Spit imprint. And then I'm going to take my Getting Pregnant with Michelle T. blog and turn it into a memoir. Yes. So that's... That's on the agenda. That's exciting. Yeah. You're so prolific. Asking. I mean, I don't know. Have you written a book while we've been sitting here? <laughs> 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 All right. We have time for a couple more questions. If anyone has anything to ask. Nothing? All right. We have one here. Um, so my favorite thing that you've ever written, I've read a lot of your work, um, but you wrote this blog post about moon boots for the Ironing Board Collective. Wow, <laughs> yeah, I did. And I just read it today because I was like, oh, I'm going to see Michelle T. I'm so excited. And you'd mention Unzipped 
in the blog post. So it's Unzipped. Like, that's the YouTube Isaac Mizrahi YouTube. documentary. Thank you. That's what it's called. <laughs> I knew I knew what it was called at one point. Um, and I also really loved your Exo Jane blog. So I wondered if you'll do more blogging um i did my final exo jane post like last week um i realized like um my my editor actually for this book was like basically like gently reminded me that i never like let the reader my readership know that i actually had the baby <laughs> <laughs> so i wrote that and then i didn't and then there were so many things in the in the comments that were like god we were so scared something terrible oh happened god. so like, basically i just got hella pregnant and then i just like <laughs> fell off and i just was like i was like i don't have time to what write a this cliffhanger yet <laughs> I just was like, I just got so pregnant that I couldn't do anything except eat and masturbate. <laughs> that was it. That's all I could do. So and meanwhile, everyone's like, <laughs> like, oh, oh God. God, what happened to her? Poor wow. thing. Wow. So yeah. So um, I don't know. It's really hard to get writing done right now. So it's hard to think about doing, especially something that's like a blog. It's so, there is this pressure to be regular with it. So that feels extra intimidating when I have this book to finish. I have a couple other like little undercover projects I kind of am trying to crank out. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I'll blog again because it's it's so fun, you know, to have that kind of immediate. I really I really enjoy that because I can do my first thought, best thought because this thing because it's like you know nobody edits their blogs, do they? I don't know. I, I certainly don't edit mine. So and I feel like it's a blog. I don't have to. So I, I like that format for that reason. But thank you. You're very kind. I'm glad that you found the, the that fashion blogging was really fun. It was so. Good. It was very very fun to do. Yeah. I would love for you to do a fashion blog. I did one for a while. I don't know if Thomas Page McBee is still here. He was he was here earlier but um, we had done this uh, blog together with a few other people called ironing board collective where we each took turns um, blogging about fashion one day a week and it was really fun so fun and it just gave me like I don't know um, it, like I was able to go up to like and take people's pictures and stuff it kind of gave me this reason to kind of like reach out to people who look amazing on the streets and stuff so Do you maybe have a favorite designer um, I really like Alexander Wang I really like Vivian Westwood all the usual suspects, you know. Yeah, the huge. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, I think that just about does it for tonight. Uh, on behalf of Emily and the Strand, thank you all so much for coming out. And thank you uh, to Saeed and Michelle for coming here as well. Uh, feel free to stick around and get your book signed. We have some pens back here. More copies of uh, both authors' books are available at the back of the room for purchase. And uh, thanks again for coming out. Thanks, everybody.